the Obama administration's unveiled its plan to stabilize the banking industry. On Monday, Treasury Secretary Timothy Geithner announced the government plan to buy up as much as $1 trillion in troubled mortgages and other risky assets from banks. Wall Street was certainly happy with the plan, with all the major stock indexes soaring as soon as the market opened. The Dow Jones Industrial Average ended the day up nearly 500 points. Investors saw the plan as a way to rescue the U.S. financial system, clearing a path to recovery from what many have described as the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. The crisis has been largely blamed on deregulation of the financial industry and lax government oversight. But a new article in the latest issue of Harper's Magazine argues otherwise. It reads, quote, No amount of New Deal regulation or SEC watching could have stopped what happened. The problem was not that we deregulated the New Deal, but that we deregulated a much older, even ancient set of laws. The article goes on to say, quote, we dismantled the most ancient of human laws, the law against usury, which had existed in some form in every civilization from the time of the Babylonian Empire to the end of Jimmy Carter's term. The article in Harper's Magazine is written by Thomas Gagan a Chicago-based labor lawyer, recent congressional candidate, and author of many books. His most recent is See You in Court, How the Right Made America a Lawsuit Nation. His Harper's article is called Infinite Debt, How Unlimited Interest Rates Destroy the Economy. Thomas Gagan joins us from Chicago. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Hi, Amy. It's good to have you with us. Okay, how did we get here, or how did they get us in this mess? Uh, in the article I talk, that appeared in Harper's, I've talked about the fact that uh, uh, we've not focused enough on the big deregulation that precedes all other deregulations, and that's the uh, ceiling that has existed on the financial sector in, for, since time immemorial on the amount of interest that banks can get from their uh, clients, their customers, their depositors. Uh, historically, and even up through movies like It's a Wonderful Life with uh, Frank Capra and Mr. Potter and George Bailey, uh, the interest rates in this country were capped at 8 percent, 9 percent. Uh, in the 1970s, we began to deregulate this, and then we had a massive big bang with a Supreme Court case that effectively knocked out all the interest rate caps. And we have today taken as common that banks can charge 17, 18, 19, 30, 35 percent, not to mention payday lenders charging 200, 300, 400 percent in states like Illinois, California. Um, Tom Gagan, uh, let's uh, go back to that 1978 case, Marquette National Bank versus First of Omaha Service Corporation. Explain the significance of it. What was it? Sure. That's the Brown versus Board of Deregulation for, uh, the, uh, uh, for the financial sector. Uh, the, the case, uh, uh, Justice Brennan, of all people, opinion, uh, uh, said that uh, banks that operate, out-of-state banks, that were subject to the National Banking Act of 1864, signed by President Lincoln in the middle of uh, the uh, uh, Wilderness Campaign, uh, effectively uh, preempted any state regulation capping the interest rates of those banks when they sent their credit cards in from out of state. Now, uh, back in 1864, banks in Delaware weren't operating out in Nebraska or handing out credit cards across the country, and there was no such thing as Visa or MasterCard. The effect of this was that the big national banks were not subject to any state usury law because uh, the Banking Act of 1864 had no interest rate cap on it, not contemplating the kind of situation that we're in today. And in effect, this sealed what had been a trend throughout the country, which is lifting these interest rate caps for banks and giving consumers easy credit on the premise that they would just pay tons and tons of interest uh, so that the banks were protected if the loan weren't repaid. In fact, the banks had incentive to hand out credit cards and hope that the loans would not be repaid because the interest rates on these uh, credit cards were so high. Uh, you know, if, if you are Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life and can only get 6 percent, 7 percent on your loan, you want the loan to be repaid. Moral character is important. You want to scrutinize everybody very carefully. 
But if you're able to charge 30 percent, or in a payday lender case, 200 or 300 percent, uh, you don't care so much if the loan. In fact, you actually want the loan not to be repaid. You want people to go into debt. You want to accumulate this interest. And uh, this addicted the financial sector to very, very, very high rates of return compared to what investors were used to getting in the real economy, the manufacturing sector, General Motors, which would give piddling five, six, seven percent returns. So the capital in this country began to shift in the financial sector. That's why the financial sector began to bloat up. That's why we ended up, by 2006, having a third of all profits going into the banks and the financial firms and not into the real economy. Thomas Gagan is our guest. Uh, his piece in the latest issue of Harper's Magazine, Infinite Debt, How Unlimited Interest Rates Destroyed the Economy. We'll be back with him in a minute. I'm Amy Goodman. Our guest is Thomas Gagan. He has a very interesting piece in the latest issue of Harper's Magazine. It's called Infinite Debt, How Unlimited Interest Rates Destroyed the Economy. Um, Tom Gagan, you talk about how with no law capping interest, the evil is not only that banks prey on the poor, they've always done so, but that capital gushes out of manufacturing into banking. When banks get 25 percent to 30 percent on credit cards and 500 or more percent on payday loans, capital flees from honest pursuits like auto manufacturing. Now, I've just come back from Grand Rapids this weekend and going through Detroit. Um, they're in dire situation talking about money yes. fleeing from the auto industry. Sure. Uh, I feel uh, uh, one of the reasons I am in favor of the bailout of the auto industry is, uh, uh, aside from all the other reasons, a sense of guilt that we uh, uh, set up all the returns in this uh, economy in favor of financial uh, firms and, and really disinvested from industry. Uh, and even worse, we began to turn industry uh, into uh, a banking itself. General Motors, General Electric began to operate banks because that's where they made the big profit uh, uh, in the loans to consumers, uncapped interest. Uh, it's, it's a very destructive situation. And this isn't some uh, left-wing uh, progressive critique uh, circa 2009. Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations warned how important it is to have interest rate caps on the financial sector or all the money will gush into there and out of productive uses. Keynes in the general theory of employment, interest and money, the great classic 1936, has a little chapter at the end saying, uh, yes, we have deficit spending. I've got this way of getting out of the Depression. By the way, we've got to keep the interest rate caps on the banks. Well, we took that stuff off. The, the thing that was kind of an instinct in human and legal civilization from the time of the Code of Hammurabi up to the present. And we created all these incentives for money to go into speculation derivatives because we addicted the economy to very, very high rates of return by squeezing money out of people. And uh, the, the, the way in which we disinvested from the economy was, uh, in my view, not so much uh, uh, globalization or trade as, as the fact that we had preteens in, in shopping malls who were running up, uh, you, you know, debts where they were paying 25, 30 percent interest when uh, investors could only get 5, 4, 3 percent from our uh, globally competitive industry.